Thank you, everybody. Uh, my name's Justin Dion. I'm Chief Technical Officer for the Insolvency Service. And I have the pleasure today of chairing uh, a paper on enabling greater use of the restrictions imposed by Section 216 of the Insolvency Act for use of company name. Um, as it says on there, this is a joint paper between Stuart Perry and Ben Luxford, who's R3's Head of Technical. Unfortunately, Ben can't make it today, but I'm very pleased to see that despite numerous train problems and, in fact, cancelled and delayed trains, Stuart has made it, otherwise it would be a very short session without him. Um, so just by way of introduction, Stuart is a partner in Field Fisher's Insolvency and Restructuring Practice. He primarily acts for insolvency practitioners, various categories of financier distress companies and their directors. His experience covers the full range of insolvency work from purchases and sales in trading insolvencies to multinational, multi-million pound frauds. He also has the honour of being the chair of the R3 General Technical Committee, a member of the policy group and a member of the council, as well as being a member of the consulting editorial boards for the LexisNexis Restructuring and Insolvency PSL product. I've been told under no circumstances can we run over, so no press assure. Straight okay. up to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, oh look, I did it as well, look. It's down. Down is the next one. For the next, down is the, for the next people. Um, so this is this is like research and technical stuff, obviously, and you're hearing lots of academic stuff. This is definitely more of a technical one rather than academic one. So apologies because I'm not an academic. Um, it was supposed to be me and Ben. Um, Ben is a wonderfully talented technical director at um, R3, so all of the good parts of my talk were written by him. Uh, all of the bad things were written by me, for which apologies, and if Ben has been able to get online, get well soon. Um, free, free, please feel free to ask questions or heckle throughout, because otherwise it will get very boring, and uh, I tend to tell very bad jokes if people don't say anything, and you don't want that. Um, but aside from that, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me. And we'll move on with the talk, which starts with Phoenix Companies. So the point of 216 um, is all about Phoenix Companies. And this is the definition the insolvency is given online in one of its things. And it's basically when one company dies, we'll call it Company A, goes into liquidation, and the business and everything else carries on under the new banner of Company B. And... The point of this is to try and stop people abusing the limited liability status that a company brings by saying, well, if a, if a director keeps doing this, we want to stop him abusing that. Um, so that's what Phoenix companies are, and that's what 216 is supposed to prevent. So on the basis that some of you won't live with 216 all the time, um, I thought I'd explain what 216 is about first. So section 216 of the Insolvency Act 1986 kicks in when a company goes into insolvent liquidation. And company A, our first company, um, has gone into insolvent liquidation and in the 12 months preceding that has been known by a particular name. And known by means the registered name of the company or the trading name of the company. So then if the director or a shadow director during those 12 months then goes into a new company, Company B, which continues to trade using a similar name, then they breach 216, unless they get a court order permitting it or they fall within one of the exceptions. So what does similar mean? I thought I'd explain that slightly so you could understand that. Um, there's two cases. Uh, one is revenue and customers commissions against Walsh. So company A was SG&T Walsh Company Limited, which went into liquidation. And the second company was called Walsh Construction Limited. So, well, that's similar enough that they should, they contravened section 216, so they're liable. The second one was revenue and customs commissioners against Benton Diggins. And there, there was a company, Company A, was called Williams Hair Studios Limited, and it went into liquidation. And it carried on a hairdressing business from the premises with the name Williams above the door. A second company was created, so our Company B, um, and it was called Williams and Express Limited. 
also trading from the same premises um, and styled itself as Williams Hair Studio. And again, they said that was so similar that you've breached section 216. There aren't that many cases on it, but that's just an example. That's what 216 is. And if you breach that, there is a strict criminal liability. It's uh, a maximum of two years in prison and a fine. As you can imagine, it's rarely prosecuted. So having looked at the stats for 21-22, thank you, Justin, um, the compliance team at the civil service handled 223 uh, Section 216 breach cases. 185 were rectified. So they changed the name um, or got court permission. Oh, actually, no, because 62, they applied to court for leave to act. And in seven cases, they were prosecuted. So it's a, it's a rare thing. Um, oh, wrong way. Down, down. Um, so I've included this slide because it kind of it's a graphic display of what we're talking about, and it took me ages to create this, so I wasn't going to leave it out. <laughs> um, so you've got, if it's the 12 months preceding liquidation, that's when the prohibited name is used, you're not allowed to use it for five years afterwards. I was really pleased with that until I realised that the 12 months before isn't a fifth of the size of the red one on the right, <laughs> so I'm going to have to try, it's going to take me another three weeks to fix that now. <laughs> but anyway, I like that slide, so you're seeing it. Um, so what are the exceptions? There are three exceptions. Obviously, you've got the court order route. If you, if you get a court order, you're fine. Um, but one is that you've purchased the business from an insolvency practitioner. So you've purchased it, and you've told all of the creditors that you've done that. So obviously, what they're trying to do is limit phoenixism and people getting around this, this abusive process. So what you do is, you, well, if you tell everyone about it anyway, You've bought the business from an independent regulated person, so you've paid proper value, and you've told everyone about it, then that would seem to be OK. So that's one exception. Second exception is where you make an application to court within six weeks and say, please, can I continue using this name? So you can carry on using the name whilst the court is trying to deal with that application. And the third exception is that our company B, in our case, has already traded using that name. Uh, so if it's been traded for 12 months preceding that, then it works. Um, so that's the criminal liability dealt with. So we know now how you can be criminally liable. So what's the... Down, down, down. What's the civil ramifications? So this is section 217 of the Insolvency Act. Um, and this makes directors, shadow directors, or front people, um, liable for company B's debts. Uh, a front person is someone that acts on the instruction of the person that would otherwise be in breach of 216. So you, the person that is in breach of 216 might put their, their spouse in place to be the director and tell that spouse what to do, that sort of thing. Um, so let's say, uh, um, sorry, it's, it's all debts that accrue in company B whilst it's trading with that prohibited name, okay, during that five-year period. So it's quite handy if company B then goes into a process because that director is then liable for everything else, yeah? So we're going to take as an example Mr. Baddy, who trades as the best fish and chip shop cafe, and every year, he puts his company under so that he can avoid rates and taxes, right? So provided company A goes into liquidation, every year he pushes the next company under, provided it still trades as the best fish and chip company ever, then he will be liable for all of those five years' worth of debts, even though they've gone into processes. So that's what 217 is supposed to achieve. How am I doing on time? I'm doing pretty good on time as well, aren't I? Yeah. Um, so that's, the, that's where we are now. Is everyone OK with where we are now? Wonderful. It's going far too quickly. Um, but as I said, if you don't ask questions, I'm going to tell a joke. No one has yet asked a question. So if you're American when you go in the toilet and you're American when you leave the toilet, 
What are you when you're in the toilet? European. <laughs> My son's favorite joke, he's nine. I thought I'd share that with you. Um, so what doesn't work? Is this a serious academic forum? OK. Um, what doesn't work? Well, one of the difficulties with this is it has to go into liquidation first. So if company A doesn't go into liquidation, then it doesn't start. T16 never gets triggered. So if Mr. Baddy puts his company A into dissolution, and then B into dissolution, and C into dissolution, you never actually start it. And a liquidation will cost about, what, five grand minimum if you've got all the, the deposit, the court fees, the lawyer's fees. So if you're a creditor that's owed a few grand, 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand even, are you going to, are you going to add to that and spend five grand to put a company into liquidation when you don't expect to get anything back? You're not, really. And is the, is the director going to put the company into voluntary liquidation? No, because that costs thousands of pounds as well. And instead, what they can do is spend £10 to dissolve it at company's house, or £8 if you do it online. <laughs> so as you, and so the, the biggest issue with this is it doesn't bite for dissolved companies. And there are, but there are lots of companies where it will be dissolved legitimately. So we need to keep that into, into consideration as well. But if you have a look at the numbers, um, People watching on the thing won't be able to see those. But in 2012-13, there were just over 20,000 uh, liquidations. Uh, this is just England and Wales, by the way. Um, but, and there were 260,000 dissolutions. So there were 10 times the number of dissolutions. And if we go up to last year, 21-22, there were 22,000 liquidations, so not many more. But there were 524,000 dissolutions. 23 times as many. So whilst there isn't any statistical analysis of how many companies will carry on trading using the same name, because obviously it's not the registered name, it's the trading name. So you wouldn't actually know unless you knocked on the door. Um, we don't know how many of those 546,000 are people trying to get around the prospect of 216 by putting it into dissolution instead. Um, what's another reason why it doesn't work? Well, you've got to put some effort into working out whether or not they've contravened section 216. Have they traded in a similar name? Are they a director or a shadow director? Is that the spouse of the director of the previous company? And all of these things people might know a bit about, but, but won't have usually the energy to go into doing it. And I don't know about anyone else that deals with insolvencies on a daily basis. For the first month, all the creditors are very, very in, into it. For the first six months, they're quite engaged. After that, they've gone back to selling widgets or making chairs, or whatever it is they do, because it's not their day job to think about insolvency. So once you've got over the initial pain and frustration of the insolvency process, they move on to the next thing, and they forget about the things that they could otherwise do. So it's, it's um, with a lot of creditors, they're un, unaware of the things they would need to show, um, and most creditors are also unaware of this as a potential right. Um, we, yeah, I, I act for creditors a lot. Um, I will tell them about this, and, and they'll go, oh, I didn't know that. And there's nothing in the, le the in literature that people give out all the time to explain about this. So it's also not a well-known thing either. And also, obviously, if you're looking at people that have been supplying widgets, and they're owed five or six grand, and then they're owed five or six grand the next time, they're owed five or six grand for the next time, they're unlikely to go to a law firm and say, this, is, this seems to be unfair. Can you tell me what my rights may be? Um, so what this will do, what the present version of the system will do, will help if company A has gone into liquidation and there is a significant enough creditor by quantum that they will be bothered to investigate and put some legal fees into seeing if there's something they can do. 
Um, so that's why I don't think it works. Hooray. So how can it be improved? And this is, everyone, this is the last slide. So we're going really, we're going really well here. Um, so General Technical Committee at R3 that Ben and I are on, um, we're thinking about uh, ways that we can try and help society. Um, and this is, we thought there must be a way of fixing this that isn't too onerous and can mean that we can all actually make 216 work better. Uh, in fact, 217 work better because it's the civil liabilities that are the things that people will want to make work. So the first and most obvious one is to make it so that it bites when there's a company that has been dissolved. Not just gone into liquidation, but dissolved. Because that will then also catch those that have gone into administration and been dissolved, which is another large amount of these cases. Most of the time now, when I've got a company that goes into admin, it goes into dissolution afterwards, not into liquidation. Um, we would obviously want to make sure it doesn't impact on those people that dissolve their company and it's okay. So we want it to be those where the company has been dissolved and it's balance sheet insolvent. So that would be the trigger. So it would either be it goes into liquidation, it goes into an insolvent administration, um, because then the one-year look-back period would be from when it goes into admin, which would be better, um, or dissolution when it's balance sheet insolvent. That would then mean that we have 524,000 cases to look at rather than 22,000 for last year. What else can be improved? Now, this is one um, that I like the idea of. And whilst there was quite a bit of debate about this in the technical committee, we kind of thought we got to the place where it was um, fair on everyone. So, quite often you find that creditors won't have enough debt owed to them that they would bother looking into this, as I've said before. And it's not cost effective for you to bring a claim to show that that name was so similar if you're only owed 5, 10, 20 grand. And you kind of think, well, how much money would you need to be owed before you do that? 100, 150? Especially if you're then adding on, are they a shadow director or not? I mean, given the cost of that process, what, 200, 250 grand? So it's not going to be brought in a lot of cases unless you can amalgamate them all. So if the liquidator of company B was able to bring a claim on behalf of all of the small creditors so that they were all consolidated together, suddenly you have someone whose job it is to sue people, as in that's what a liquidator does, so they'd be happy to do that. Um, it's kind of like part of their bread and butter, so they would be involved. Um, and you'd have enough of a debt pile for them to actually make it cost-effective and economic. Um, but if we're doing that, and we're taking it out of the hands of the creditors, then that means that they would lose their personal right to go against the director, because Section 217 allows them to go directly against the, the baddie director. So how do we get around that, and how do we fix that? So the way that I think we would do that is the liquidator would give notice to all creditors and say, I am going to bring a claim on behalf of all of you, list them all out and say, under section 217, against this director, uh, unless you bring a claim yourself in the next four, six weeks, whatever the time period is. And if you do, crack on and do it, and that's fine. If you don't, you will lose that right, and we can bring it on behalf of everyone. That then means that they can make a recovery. It will then come into the estate of Company B. We were thinking, should we hold it on trust for all of the creditors that you're bringing that claim on behalf of? And it does, we worked out, uh, after quite a bit of debate, it doesn't really work that way, because if you held it on trust for them, you then have a conflict. Because if the, if the liquidator had a claim against the director for something else, like a misfeasance, and a 217 claim, but the results of that would go for different people. Whoever got there first might get all the money. So the only way it really works is if you can do it on behalf of all the creditors. So that's what we thought would, would be the best way of it working. Um, and obviously, you're going to tell all the creditors this. You're going to say, I am going to bring a claim 
in respect of the debt, it's going to come into the estate and that's going to be shared between everyone, not just you. But if you want, you can just go and do it yourself. And if they go and do it themselves, fair play, they get the whole amount. And if they don't, then it makes the estate better. And I don't know about other people that, in the audience, but if ever I've gone to creditors and said, I have a claim against the director, it's a claim for 100 grand, but it might cost us 100 grand, 100 grand to bring it, so you might not actually get anything from this. Do you want us to bring it or not? They always say yes, because they say, that guy has done that bad thing to me. I'd rather he didn't get the money. I'd rather you spend it all in fees than he kept it. So if we go to creditors and say, look, we can bring a claim. We're going to try and get all these debts off him. You might not get much out of this, but there will be something that comes out of it. Are you all right with that? And they'll probably say yes. But if they don't like that, they can make the claim anyway. And it also means, as well as giving the ability of creditors that don't have enough debt to actually get involved and move it forward, it will mean that they're at least aware of what's happening. They will know it's a right. So the next time when they're owed 100 grand and they get, they've had these notices a few times, they go, oh, yeah, we have that right, don't we? So it will drive awareness as well. Sorry. Yes. I just thinking, if you're going out to creditors to say, you know, it's a hundred grand claim, it might cost me a hundred grand, are you okay with that? Presumably you've got to have the hundred grand in the estate to begin with, otherwise you're going to have to be asking, you know. No. No? So, okay. So, I, mean, there, I mean, there are a number of people that I know well in the I heard, audience. I heard no. That will, that will <laughs> do, do make such a claim on the basis that they're going to get paid out of recoveries. Yeah. Um, obviously, if the director's got no money, you're not going to go after the director anyway. So you'd have assessed it and, and worked that bit out. Yes. Oh, sorry, she needs the mic. Go on, shoot me down. Or no, me down. actually, I'm coming okay. around to the idea. I was a little negative at first, but yeah, I get it now. Um, uh, is there potentially a spin off here from a regulatory perspective that if you are an insolvency practitioner that is looking down the barrel of the possibility of uh, being able to bring an action against directors in that capacity, you most certainly shouldn't be taking cases where you've previously acted for those directors. So you would potentially introduce another regulatory lever there as well at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Sorry, I was just that's, a an, that's an even another great reason for this. And there's people in government here, they might think it's a good idea. Right. <laughs> Hi, uh, how, how would you corral creditors that aren't in uh, formal insolvency, such as in uh, the dissolution such scenario that you mentioned? So company A can go into dissolution. The, so the ability for an insolvency office holder to work would only be if company B goes into... But you could have dissolution after dissolution then, couldn't you? Oh, yeah. But, but you've but, got no office holder. So then, so then, yeah, it won't work because you would need okay. an office holder to bring it. But, but, but let's say it's happened. So the difficulty is getting the first one, right? Because once the second one has happened, then they are liable. So if, if for instance, someone would say to Francis, Francis, there is this company, it's been dissolved, but the director's already liable for 500 grand because he was a director of a dissolved company first. Would you restore it and put it into liquidation for us? She'd go, yeah, I'll do that, and then I'll, then I'll beat up the director and I'll get the money back. Um, so that, so, so as, long, as, long as, the, as long as the first dissolution can be company A, then you'll get people that are willing to fund putting company B into a process. The difficulty is, if company A hasn't been in a process, what you're doing, if you've got to put company A into liquidation first, you're paying that five grand to put it into liquidation, on the basis that at some stage in the future, there might be a company B that goes under. Whereas if it's dissolution, then company A is just triggered by it going into dissolution. You don't need to pay that five grand first. All you're doing then is paying the five grand for the second one, where you know the claim is already there. Oh, hang on, there's two, three! <laughs> Stop asking me questions! <laughs> Okay, thanks, Jude. I, I, maybe I'm not keeping up with you, um, which would, not for the first time. Um, if you've got the dissolution situation that you're positing, you've got, obviously, first of all, to look and see whether the 
the dissolved company was insolvent. Mm. But you're not going to have a statement of affairs or anything like that to work from, are you? How are you going to actually establish that? And secondly, who the creditors might be who'd come into the scheme? But So company A can go into dissolution. Yeah. For, 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 my, for my liquidator of company B, company B will be in liquidation. Yeah. yeah. So, so the only thing you'd have to do is have a creditor of company A to say, well, I was owed money by company A and haven't been paid. Yeah, OK. So, so then you, but you do need that credit. But you do yeah. need that credit. Yeah. But you would, I'm, I'm doing this on the assumption that it's a rogue that's doing a number of these. So a creditor of company B would have been a creditor of company A as well, because that's how you'd know about it. Fair, yeah. fair enough. It might be practically difficult, but I, I well, see where but you're but coming it might, from. But it yeah. might be the revenue. It might be rates. So, I mean, that, that would be... I mean, you'd, you'd ask government yep. bodies first, wouldn't no, you? No. We've probably got time for one more question. We've only got two minutes left, so apologies. Oh, there's a lady in the... I got chosen. It's uh, Simon from the policy section. Um, looking at your question about allow the liquidator of company B to bring claims, the, 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 the section 217 claim rests with the creditor. It's, it's yeah. the creditor's right of action. Yeah. Um, do you think you can just take that away by um, sending a letter saying that if you don't do anything, we're going to take your property from you? I mean, our drafting is section 217A that allows this to happen. Um, I, wasn't, but, I wasn't necessarily thinking in terms but, well, of drafting, I, I think in terms of, you know, my stuff, you know, if somebody can well, write well, me a letter. Well, I suppose, I suppose the thing is that at the moment, that, aside from section 217, so if, if, we, if we leave suit, section 217 aside, a director of a company is not liable for that company's debts, yeah? So the creditor only has that direct right against, against the director because of section 217. So if Section 217 creates that liability, yeah. an amendment to Section 217 can say that liability only exists for a given period. I don't, I don't, I don't see why you can. OK, thank you. The lady, lady in front. Uh, so this, yeah, this would have to be the last, last question, one. sorry. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say, you, you mentioned administration in mm. passing, and I know you're, you've mostly focused on liquidation, but if this is coming up as an agenda item for review. Can I point out that the, the exception doesn't work well with administration? If you're, because when, if you have a company going into administration, you do mm. a, a business sale, yeah. you don't know at that point whether it's going to go into liquidation. So you don't know whether 216 is going to become relevant. And yet you have to decide, do I notify the creditors in yeah. relation, and, and you can't really notify the creditors unless you know it's going to apply. So it, yeah. it doesn't, and so then you end up so in a situation the, just having to wait and see whether you then have to apply to Maybe it's just on. the 12-month 12, 12 look-back period should start when it goes into liquidation or, li liquidation or administration. That would be, that would, that would achieve that. Well, it would. It would make it more onerous for administration. But, you know, I'm just, just pointing out that perhaps yeah. uh, when, when, you, when, 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 the, when the review happens, Paul, it would be useful if that could be taken into account. Okay. <laughs> I will, I will add that we've we've got we've got the draft we've got the draft legislation done and everything. <laughs> Honestly, it's been like thirty of us have been thinking about how this can work. It's there, ready for you. Um, have, if we've yeah. got time, I can say another joke, or are we? No, no. I think um, <laughs> actually, I could have saved everybody from the joke, given the number of questions we've got online as well. <laughs> so apologies for that. We do have loads of questions online, so we're trying to pick those up a bit later. But um, thank you, Stuart. That was really, really cool. interesting. Thanks. <laughs>